Kids are curious. That's what being a kid is all about. But with that curiosity comes challenges and sometimes dangers. As a parent, you do your best to keep them safe, healthy, and happy through it all. So they can be, well, kids. Being a kid can be hard. So we do everything we can to help you be the best parent you can be with free or low-cost health coverage for all Pennsylvania kids. Learn more at chipcoverspakids.com. Paid for with Pennsylvania taxpayer dollars. Hey, it's Christine from Storyworthy. Today on the show, comedian Pete George talks about how he was once hired to do stand-up comedy on Continental Airlines. I get to the airport in Cleveland, and there's a big marquee with my headshot at the gate. Appearing this flight, Pete George! (laughs) Now, we're not allowed to use the plane's PA system. She has a microphone with a little tiny handheld speaker that she holds up next to my head while I'm standing there. So my third flight back to Cleveland... We get on the plane and there's four people. So I look at the rep from Continental. I go, do I have to do the show? She says, yeah, you still got to do it. I'm like, really? For four people? She says, yeah, you got to do it. Today on the show, comedian Pete George tells a really funny story about being hired to do stand-up comedy on Continental Airlines. Stay close. Hey, it's Pete George, and you are listening to Story Worthy. Worthy. My name is Christine Blackburn, and I'm coming to you from Los Angeles, California. Whether you're a longtime fan of the show or a new listener, welcome to Storyworthy. I don't know if you knew this, Pete George, who's sitting in front of me, but I'm coming up on my nine-year anniversary with wow. Storyworthy. Yeah. Nine years. July 10th will be uh, nine years. You started when you were 11? That's exactly right. Excellent. That's exactly right. And uh, <laughs> I've learned a lot. Uh, no, but it is, it is crazy. Oh, well, listen, it sounds so cliche to say time flies. But uh, it's, I mean, like the Adam Carolla show was like 10 years ago. Right. Mark Maron was 10 years ago. Yeah. Risk was 10 years ago. I was uh, just nine. So I'm not quite where those guys are. But uh, I definitely have done a lot of shows. Yeah. And you I have enjoy a, it. You have a buttery voice. A buttery voice. Very buttery. Very smooth. Yeah, I like it. Interesting. You should hear some of the audiobooks I've done. Mm. Some on the... Uh, <laughs> you know, when you start doing audiobooks, yeah. you know, I don't do them anymore, but uh, when you do them, they always start you like in romance slash... Uh, not porn, but uh, what do they call it? Soft Erotica. Poor? Erotica. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I could yeah. see them starting you there too. Yeah, I did a couple. Oh, it's so stupid, man. Anyway, you can find that, you guys. You dig deep enough, you will find stuff wow. about me. You don't even know. Awesome. I'm telling you. Uh, listen, I hope you enjoyed the show last week with Mike Bonifer. Mike Bonifer is a, he's like an entrepreneur. He's a, he's a storyteller. He created this company called Big Story. And anyway, the point is, he's not like a regular comedian. Like, I mostly have comedians like you. Right. Mike Bonifer, not a comedian, but a super funny guy and very very talented and he tells a story Mm. about how mike tyson helped deliver his baby wow and i say mike are you sure that's the title of the story because i don't want to know the story ahead of time but i do want to know what are we talking about he goes christine mike tyson helped deliver my baby wow so anyway uh you know go back and listen to that guys yeah no kidding but not today because i'm here now with comedian pete george and he brings forth a topic Performing stand up on Continental Airlines. Yeah. Which is so funny. I you know, I was a I was a flight attendant for like seven years. Yeah. But when I was a flight attendant in the late eighties and nineties, it was much more serious a vibe. You know what I mean? We yeah. wore the navy I mean they still a lot of people still wear the navy wool suits, but I mean it was like very um you know, they, they'd gone to this mode of not being like sexy stewardesses. They went the other direction, and now we were called safety professionals. Ah. And it was a double-breasted <laughs> blazer, and it was, you know, right. uh, pl- uh, pleated pants, and it was navy pumps, and serving garments. And, you know, so, but I remember when Southwest came along, and I thought that was so, like, wow, they're so, like, you know, out there that they're wearing, you know, polo shirts and khakis. Yeah. But why? Why would we have ever treated it like it was some 
It is just transportation. Do you know what I mean? Well, and it is. Why was it, it was so like revealed, yeah, and, reviled? And they were very funny and casual on the PA system. And I remember all that. Just like, wow, they're really saying this stuff? Yeah, on Southwest. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Completely. It was much more staunch. So right. when you were doing this um, comedy for Continental, can I just ask you the year? Uh, it was probably the early, early 90s. Okay. I know that Continental... Same time then, really. Yeah, Continental had just filed for bankruptcy, so I, I think they were kind of in a space of being desperate. They were huge in, in Houston, right? That was their big hub? Yeah, I think the hub was in Cleveland, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. You're from Cleveland. Originally, I know yeah. that, because yeah. we've already fought about you know football, the Browns, yeah. Sure. And I know where you're from. <laughs> Cranberry and all that. And... <laughs> Cranberry. Yeah. That's so funny. <laughs> Throwing out Pittsburgh references. That makes me laugh. Yeah. I'm going back to Pittsburgh next week, actually. How are you? Yeah, for the first time in a while, and uh, but I look forward to it. It'll, yeah, be, it'll see be fun. See family, friends? Family, friends, doing a show, you know. See how yins are, see how yins are doing? Yins are doing. Yeah. Get some, get some uh, go downtown and that, and you know, yeah. pop an iron. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> anyway, listen, so Pete, you are a comedian and you know, I, like I said, I've had a lot of comedians on the show, but you do so much traveling. Yeah, I have. And you perform all over. Yeah. You're just traveling constantly. Not like I used to. I mean, yeah. sometimes I go out like once a month, once every five, six weeks, and yeah. then I'll pepper it with shows here and there. Yeah. So I kind of mix it up right now because I'm up to creating other things staying in town. Since you've done so many gigs, like, I mean, you've done gigs like, you know, like the Planet Hollywoods and the Hard Rocks and the Pachanga Resorts, House of Blues, like all these chains, it sounds like, as it were. Yeah. Uh, what's your favorite thing to do? You know, I... I like little rooms where yeah. it's very intimate, but I also love big rooms with, you know, a couple thousand people. It's just, you have to completely change up your energy, but I like working at all. It's just, it makes it more interesting. Yeah. Um, what I don't like is performing at the Mississippi Valley Fair in Iowa. Yeah. Because we performed at midnight in the beer tent after the boxing rings. That is unbelievable. And it was so bad, the, the sheriff who hired us <laughs> had to walk up on the boxing ring, <laughs> had his hand on his gun, and had to walk us off the stage. Because people were taunting you so much? Oh, it was horrible. Well, what, the, why they were, were drunk. They... <laughs> there was a boxing matches, you know, they wanted to fight us. And That is so funny. Yeah, it was horrible. Stand-up comedy in the wrong place where people don't want yeah. to hear it yeah. is just a nightmare. Yeah. You really have to abandon any jokes at all and just go to what is happening. Kind of, yeah. I mean, How can you push forward? That's, see, now, that's, that's a good point. I mean, years ago, I did a, a corporate show in cold, was it... God, it was some. It was two hours east west of Toledo. Yeah, and I drove three hours from Cleveland. And I get there. I'm driving through corn and everything. I get there. I'm at this community center, this little town, and it felt really odd. And I see a sign on the door that said, "Absolutely no alcohol, no profanity, no tobacco." And I went, "Boy, I don't know if I should be here because I'm. I could be pretty edgy." Yeah. And I asked the janitor, "What? Like, what's going on here?" And he said, "Oh, they're all Mennonites." Oh, and I'm like, wow. oh, I'm dead in the water. What in the world? So they had a big curtain with a stage, and it was packed with people from the community, yeah, right? because it's an event. Right. So I said to the woman in charge, I have to go backstage because I use my electric guitar in half the show. I right. said I have to hook it up. I got to change my clothes. And then you can introduce me from the stage. So I go right behind the curtain. She walks up to the podium and introduces me. I'm not even dressed or ready. <laughs> so I'm hurrying up behind the curtain trying to get ready. And then um, I... I stick my head out through the curtain. I go, can you come here? And everybody can see this. I yeah. said, can you introduce me from the stage? Yeah, Let's yeah. just make it. She goes, fine. And she's getting mad. So she walks up to the stage. She introduces me. I walk out. She goes through the curtain. And I'm like, a round of applause for, you know, whatever her yeah. name. She thought I called her back out again. So oh. she puts her head out through the curtain. What? What now? In front of everybody. And I'm like, <laughs> and so I said, gosh, you guys, I thought you didn't allow alcohol in here. <laughs> Okay, now I and I found that out after. Is so funny. She's their boss. It's oh. for the community hospital, so I'm kind of getting some laughs. But boy, <laughs> this doesn't feel right. And then I, I, I was getting nervous, so I so I said an old hack joke just to you know. There was an old couple there, and they were married, and I made the joke, which is an old. I don't ever use this hack stuff anymore or, or old lines, but I said, "Are you married?" And they said, "Yeah." And I said, oh, "I'll give her a kiss on the cheek." And he did, and I said, now go for some tit. <laughs> you did not do I that. I swear to God. Town. I swear to God. What and I look over, and the woman is furious. She gets up, who hired me, walks up to the stage with her arms crossed, and just stares at me daggers. Oh. 
And I go, did you want to come up here? She goes, no, get out of our building. Well, what, get out why of would you do that I don't with know. the Mennonite crowd? I don't know. So I looked at the audience. I'm like, you guys are kind of laughing. Do you want me to leave? And nobody said a word. Oh, and, I, and I yelled, answer me. Oh, my god! And about five people go, yes. So I went backstage and I unplugged everything. I yanked it out. I grabbed my clothes and I, I, I just, I took off and called my manager and I was just, it stayed with me for like three years. I just, it's just really, uh, really, really funny. I just, uh, <laughs> no. I just cannot even get over that. Right. You've had so many experiences because you've played in so many different settings. You're right. To, you know, it's not like, oh, I just do comedy in the belly room or something. Oh, I just do comedy at open mic night or whatever. You've been yeah. in these situations where <laughs> you are just thrown in and I don't know. I mean, I know a lot of comedians, they go through this, but I'm yeah. really excited to hear your story about uh, performing on Continental Airlines. Yeah. Hey, you know the Mother's Day is coming up. Well, let me just tell you, the best gift you can give your mom is a FabFitFun subscription. I'm telling you, you guys, these FabFitFun boxes are just amazing. All sorts of brand new products, full sizes. You can even customize your box and it comes four times a year. So that's like giving your mom a gift four times a year. So I just got my editor's box the other day and they always have things in there I can use. Not mm. only things I can use, then things I just want. Like mm. they sent me a little pearl necklace the other day. I mean, who just gives me those presents Pete George. I got it. They send you things that I love that, that like are practical, like like leave-in hair conditioner or like eye cream that I love so much. But then they also send like really nice things. Like I got this meditation aromatherapy diffuser. Wow. I know. You plug it in and then the, a light comes on and it starts changing. All of a sudden you're like back at, you know, Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon, uh, you know, Laserium. That I could use. If you sign up for FabFitFun today, use my code STORYWORTHY and you'll get $10 off your first box. So go to FabFitFun.com to sign up and start getting the box for a life well lived. Use my promo code STORYWORTHY. You'll get 10 bucks off your first box. That's only $39.99 for all these products. You guys are going to love it. Go to FabFitFun.com, use my code STORYWORTHY and you'll get 10 bucks off your first FabFitFun box. All right, listen, you guys, we're going to get to Pete George's story here in just a second. But before we do, I wanted to remind you to follow me on Twitter and Instagram at StoryWorthy. I always appreciate that. And also, you know, on the Instagram, I have a, um, I have a whole account for Story Smash, my game show. Mm -hmm. So it's at Story Smash. And I have to tell you, I have about 400 pictures up there, and they're all of the game show. So it's really fun. So it's kind of like a a curated Instagram account. Do you yeah, know what I mean? It's right. not just like random photos. Yeah. Every, all the photos all make sense. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, because in my own Instagram feed, Storyworthy, I have a hard time not throwing something in against Trump now and then. Right. Do you know what I mean? I got it. Or like a, <clears throat> yeah. a, a funny funny, you know, right. something funny. But on Story Smash, well, I keep it funny, but I'm just saying there's a lot of great photos from the show. So check me out there if you would please. And of course, I would be remiss not to mention my other podcast, Screwed Up Stories. Screwed Up Stories, I do with comedian Rachel O'Brien. We're having a great time. Uh, we are on the Westwood One uh, network. And so, uh, you know, check out Screwed Up Stories. Yeah. Screwedupstories.com. You go there and then all the places you can subscribe are there. Yeah. So you don't have to like go to the big haystack that is Apple Podcasts. Mm. You go to screwedupstories.com. Right there. Perfect. You got choices. All there. That's what I'm saying. Got it. All right, you guys. He's here right now. Pete George. <clears throat> he is a comedian, like we said, who tours extensively. And like you were saying, you are a musician, but you're like a, a very accomplished musician. Yeah. I, I, it, it started, my father was the first accordion soloist in the military at West Point. That's super interesting. That's what he did full time. And his brother was like a huge record rep since the 60s through the 90s. Wow. Like he was in charge of the whole Midwest for MCA. So when I was in college, I'd work for him two days a week in Cleveland and I'd get all the records I want, go to the concerts. That's terrific. Call stations. And then my band at the time, we were the ones to get the petition drive started to get the rock hall in Cleveland. Oh no, kidding! Yeah, so I was there for opening and day. And were you in a, like a heavy, in a, like a heavy metal band because it was the '80s in Cleveland? No, I was in an alternative band before alternative was mainstream. Get out of here! And we were called uh, Separate Checks. Come on! Although I would tell people in my show we wanted to be like a flock of seagulls. Yeah, uh, we were called a pack of peckers. Did you have a but, lot of uh, synthesizers then? Is that what um, you're we had one, but it was just it was more of a like an it was kind of like um. 
Oh gosh, the Roland uh, D fifty, kind of like the Pretenders, oh. but a little more, little more like eighties rather than late seventies. Okay, yeah, and uh, we would play all over Cleveland, and it was a blast. I had a great time. I had that long. And how did you leave that life? Um, like, how did you decide not to do that anymore? So I, um, so in the eighties, I I really wanted to try stand up, and so I went to the Cleveland Comedy Club, which was like the only club around. And uh, every Sunday, they would have a competition with 10 people. You had to do 10 minutes. And it, half the comics were already professional. And I was absolutely terrified. Yeah. 150 people in the audience. Can't imagine. I couldn't even, literally, my, my legs buckled in the back of the room. How did you get that time? Um, you mean the 10 minutes? Yeah. Uh, I just worked on an act. No, but I mean, how did they book you for that? Oh, you just, you just go there and sign up for the competition. I see. Okay. And um, so I ended up winning. Wow. First time, 50 bucks. And then you could go up every Sunday, but my incentive was the 50 bucks. So I waited a month to go on stage again. Mm -hmm. And I ended up winning again. And then I ended up winning a third month. So my first three times were all competitions and I won all three. And then I just started getting like professional work. And of course, you know, then you start to suck. You have crappy shows and you build from there. But I mean, right out of the box, I think if I hadn't had that experience, I may not have pursued it. Yeah. Uh, You're lucky. You were so young. Yeah. yeah. You know, like you knew your path. Yeah. That's exciting. Yeah. And because I've always been involved with music, I just felt, you know, I have to in include my guitar in half the show. And, um, and yeah, and that's, it's, it's made me distinct for sure. Okay, so, uh, you know, you're a comedian, so you get it. Uh, you, I asked you to send me a small bio, and you sent me, um, like, kind of your press kit or whatever. Yeah. And I just wanted to go over some of your special skills on your resume. Oh, boy. Uh, here we have a ice skate, rollerblade, uh -huh. horseback, <laughs> horseback, you say. Yeah, oh, yeah. And you also do archery? I do. Bowling. Bowling and archery at the same time. How about mm -hmm, that? Mm -hmm. And then we move on to driver's license. <laughs> I know. <laughs> this is the stupid stuff like agents want you to have, right? And then you have stick shift. Yeah, I could drive stick shift. Uh-huh. Thank you. You also have rifle and small arms. Yes, true. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And then you have camper. Right. <laughs> This is what the agent wanted. I'm telling Scout. you. Scout. <laughs> Construction. <laughs> because, you know, when you're hiring an actor, you often want to know, you know, if they can throw up a two by four, you I, know. A yurt or something, right? I mean, you never know. I have a little construction, little one if you want to hear it, so. <laughs> no, I thought, I just, oh, and then you also have life coach. Yeah, true. Okay. True. How does that work? Uh, you go and you encourage people. I did, um, well, you know, I did the, the program, you probably know the Landmark Forum, in mm. 15 years ago, and I did all that work, and then um, I started coaching their self-expression and leadership program, which is a four-month program, and I've coached and head coached like five or six of those. And um, people are always calling me and asking me to coach them through whatever they're dealing with. And then um, I've actually used coaching on the stage to deal with hecklers instead of attacking them. And it's actually much funnier because they, <laughs> they don't know what to do with it because yeah. they think so you're going to go after them. So they say something and then you would say what? Well, they just say something. You know, I had a guy stand up and something. start yelling something, yeah. you know, yeah. and you just go into the conversation of like, well, what's like what's occurring for you in the moment? What's showing up that's making you uncomfortable? <laughs> Yeah. You know, well, you said, well, what did I say? Yeah. Like, see, it's not what I said. It's really what you made it mean. And you're coming from your past because most <laughs> emotions are a byproduct of past based experiences. Too and they're like, what? Funny. Too funny. Yeah. And you just run from there with it. And, and it's you funny. Stay really. Yeah. Because you're so um, you're speaking very clearly and well spoken. And, they and they're just drunk. Like idiots. And they're drunk. Yeah. <laughs> right. You're very funny. Uh, you guys can find Pete over there at therockstarofcomedy.com. Don't you love that? Therockstarofcomedy.com. It just, it's all there in the title. And yet I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean you're not? You, I'm you kind of silly. And, you are. I'm silly and dorky on stage, but so you, that's the contrast of the persona. But you're a really good guitar player. This is true. I mean, I've watched you on, yeah. on YouTube, a lot of your stuff. It's really great. Yeah, thanks. You also can find him over on Twitter at PeteGeorgeTV and also on Instagram. Okay, you guys, wherever you are, put your hands together for Pete George. Yay! Yay. So it was the uh, early 90s. I had been doing stand up professionally for about 18 months. And uh, there was a club, Hilarities in Cleveland, that wanted to uh, be part of this whole thing where Continental Airlines wanted to start using comics 
to perform on their planes as a promotion. So uh, I was called down to audition, and there were they picked three winners from Cleveland and two from Detroit. And in the audience, the judges were um, they were travel agents, fifty travel agents of all people to be a judge, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, because you know their sense of humor. So. so funny. Um, so I ended up winning in Cleveland, whatever, winning or getting it. Because you actually you get paid $300. So I was like, okay, that's great. So the next thing I know, I see media everywhere. Johnny Carson's talking about this, what we're going to do. Uh, Arsenio Hall, NBC, CBS, CNN, um, Wall Street Journal took out a full-page ad on this whole promotional thing. So, of course, you know, we're getting a little nervous about this. So we pick a day of the week, Monday through Friday. I figure I'm going to take Friday because, hey, it's Friday. It's casual, like a club. You know, it's going to be relaxed. So Monday, Al April takes that day. And he's an older comic from Detroit. He gets on the plane. Every seat is purchased by a media outlet. There's a camera in every seat. ABC, CBS, Fox, everybody. Now, these are 40-seat Commuter planes, uh-huh. turboprops, you know how loud those planes are. Uh-huh. Not the best place to have people focus. So Al goes up, and he was absolutely terrified because nobody's laughing, right? Because they have the camera. They're focusing on that. Yeah. So I hear this story, and I'm like, great. And now I'm getting more nervous. So end of the week, I get to the airport in Cleveland, and there's a big marquee with my headshot at the gate. Appearing this flight, Pete George. <laughs> So no, I'm really going, oh my God, I'm really nervous, right? So you run out, it's, you don't even go through the, the walk, you, you go on the tarmac and you walk out to the plane and everybody boards and it's packed and I get on and I buckle in the front and I'm just going, oh my God, oh my God, right? And I'm with the rep from Continental. So she's sitting next to me, we get up, up to altitude because you, what you do is you do four flights in three and a half hours, Cleveland to Detroit, run to the next plane, back to Cleveland, back to Detroit, back to Cleveland. So we get up to altitude, and she goes, okay, go. That's what she says. <laughs> now, we're not allowed to use the plane's PA system. She has a microphone with a little tiny handheld speaker that she holds up next to my head while I'm standing there. So basically, the first five rows can hear me. So I get up, and I'm, I'm nervous. And I just I get into my 10-minute set, and they're starting to laugh. The first few people in the front were like looking down reading. But other people start to laugh, and the, the laughter is building and getting louder and louder. I'm like, oh, this is actually pretty good. This is awesome. So I do my set. We land. I'm feeling pretty good now. So we land in Detroit. We run right to the next plane. We go back to Cleveland. Now we have about half full. So the laughter was sparse. I find out there's a writer for Just for Laughs magazine on the plane doing a story. And I'm like, oh, okay. That's, that's cool. The, the festival. The festival, yeah. And I'm like, okay, this is pretty good. And I did, I did okay for half a flight, right? So my third flight back to Cleveland, we get on the plane and there's four people, including this writer. He's going back to Detroit. And I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> so I look at the rep from Continental. I go, do I have to do the show? She goes, yeah, you still got to do it. I'm like, really? For four people? She goes, yeah, you got to do it. So we get in the plane. We buckle up. We take off. We get up to altitude. And uh, she goes, okay, go. So we both get up. And literally, the minute I get up, I grab the microphone. I go to say my first joke, and the plane just drops. And I hit my head on the ceiling. It was the worst turbulence I have ever experienced. I was trying to get in my seat. I'm hitting her. I'm falling over, and the pilot gets on. Everybody in your seats buckle up immediately. And we are all over the place. I'm looking at the people behind me, and they're, like, panicking. And I get in my seat. I finally get buckled up. My heart's pounding, thinking we're going to die. And I swear to God, the woman from Continental leans over, and she yells, if you want to get paid, you have to keep going. That is no way. Just like that. And I'm like, Get, I can't get up. She goes, no, you have to do it from your seat. <laughs> so I'm at the window, buckled in. She's next to me. She's holding the handheld speaker up. I am turned, leaned over the seat <laughs> with the microphone practically knocking my teeth out from oh the turbulence. You can hear audible gas from the people. You know that sound? Oh, sure. oh. It's like their eyes are like practically bleeding. I was so scared, and I, you know, they're freaking out, and I'm doing my little skit, you know, and she's just there, and I'm trying to do my jokes, and nobody's laughing, and the guy from Just for Laughs, I'm watching him. 
he's got his pad yeah. and he's got his pen and he's he can't even keep his hand on the pad. He's going off the pad. Yeah. And I'm doing my thing and I did my 10 minutes and um, I did what I was supposed to do. I, I wanted to get paid the 300 bucks. I was desperate, right? And uh, we land and the, uh, the rep from Continental, she, uh, so by the way, this was the only flight where the comics had turbulence. All the other comics had the best flights all week. So we get off the plane and uh, she looks at me and she goes, you know, I, I think the comedians from Detroit did better. <laughs> <laughs> She's hilarious. Yeah, and I'm like, wow. And that's when they they interviewed me a little bit more and everything, and asked what was next. And I I, I said Amtrak probably ah. after this a little bit safe. But you couldn't do airline jokes. You couldn't do drinking jokes. You you had to keep it so squeaky clean, right? And uh, and, and just very specific you had to do the same set so they knew what you were saying but oh yeah they're so of course they would be so yeah. on top of it i mean you know as a flight attendant i know that our language was very you know limited what we could say or what we could do right. you know it was just very different back then it was staunch but i remember when this started yeah because that was the era i was flying as well and you're right johnny carson talked about it like it was really in the vernacular in terms of comedy you know it was really like a, if it would happen today it would be all over twitter <laughs> uh, completely right, and you'd get a lot more exposure from it. But yeah. well, it's just ridiculous to try to captivate an audience. What if they don't want to? You know, it's just terrible. Yeah, too many distractions. I mean, what do you say to you know? You can't, you know, when you're performing in a in a room where there's like a barf bag at every seat. So how many times more did you do it? Um, I just did the four. It was promotion for the week, and that was it. And, and then did done. the whole thing end? I forget how it, it ended. Yeah, that was it. it well, they it yeah. didn't last. You're well, saying. Continental went into bankruptcy. But right away? was that? I don't, I don't, I don't know remember. if it was right away, but I think they ended it. I think they may have done it one other time before us in, uh, in Newark. Yeah. Um, and then it was, and it was our turn, and that was it. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. So you were just doing those little uh, turnarounds from turnarounds. To, to Detroit. Uh, it's so funny. You would have to wait till you get up to altitude and then get out of your seat. Get out Ten of your minutes. seat. And then did you, like, okay, when you were in the emergency situation, did you address what was going on? I no. mean, obviously. No. Well, what? <laughs> talk about what were you talking about? I had to do my set. I couldn't really ad lib. You couldn't talk to them. You just had to do your set. I went into my little jokes. I don't yeah. even remember my set, but they were jokes. That stuff is so corporate. You know, they make it. It's like right. being a Universal Studios tour guide. You know, on that tram. Right. They don't have one word of no. wiggle room in no. terms of the script. And so what happens is you don't get related to the audience, and that's that's the first thing you have to do is get related. Yeah. Right. And the thing about Cleveland to Detroit, literally, when you take off from Cleveland Airport, you just get up and you literally can see Detroit. Yeah. Like it's that short so of a flight. Funny. You're just going yeah. over the lake. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Right. We did short hops like that a lot from yeah. tiny towns in New York. There are so many tiny towns in New York and we flew to every one of them. Yeah. Like Elmira and Ithaca and, you know, Syracuse and Buffalo. There's all these little tiny... Chautauqua? I don't think we went there. <laughs> yeah. But I didn't work on the tiny planes. I always worked on, I mean, you know, small stuff like right. DC-9s, but they weren't uh, like, they weren't prop planes or they weren't, right. you know, little, com they weren't commuter jets. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, very different now uh, being a flight attendant, I think, in terms of, uh, you know, first of all, everybody has a cell phone. So that would yeah. change the environment right away. You yeah. know, because we didn't, obviously we didn't have phones, so we would have, we would read books, of course, you know, I used sure. to read a novel a week. But uh, it was a lot more, uh, I don't know, it was a lot of boredom. A lot oh, I boredom. can imagine. We flew around frequently yeah. with under 20 people on the plane. Yeah. Back then, you know, they didn't fill up every flight. It was very different. Mm -hmm. Or we would just uh, ferry a plane from one place to another, you know, just to get it in, in, right. in place, you right. know. So we would just ferry a plane from Pittsburgh to Houston just because the flight needed to take off from Houston to go to Vegas or whatever. Right. And so we would just take empty planes down and... Uh, that was always a lot of fun, yeah. ferrying around, because I always they always let me sit in the cockpit on takeoff and landing. Right, which is fun, yeah. Super fun. We Also, we would get on these uh, tray tables, like not tray tables, but they were like first-class trays, mm -hmm. and we would get on by the cockpit when we took off, Yeah. and then we would go and like let ourselves slide down the aisle in a vertical. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, that's fun. Yeah, it was like sledding on the plane. Yeah. Right, right. And then we'd watch any movies we wanted, because yeah. back then it was literally a VCR machine, as it, were, sure. as it were, and we would have all these different movies, but we had to play certain ones on certain flights, but we would 
play any movie we wanted. You know, it was uh, there was some fun stuff going on, but but all in all, uh, a kind of a, a repetitive. Right, I could imagine job. it would be boring. People think it's exciting, but yeah, I don't know. I flew uh, one time with four other comics. From well, I El- do know. I say I didn't know. I do know. Do I know, do right. know. It's boring. Yeah. I flew from LAX to Okinawa with four other comics to do shows. Mm -hmm. And uh, all the other comics took sleeping pills, and I didn't. It's smart to do that. But I was the only one that slept. They they didn't sleep. Well, they were miserable. Why? I wonder I, why. I don't know. I mean, well, they didn't have the right drugs. Maybe we landed in Osaka and it was in the morning and I had a beer and I felt great and they were just you know. Yeah. Well, they didn't take the right thing. Probably. I've also heard of um, pe- making people do comedy in front of jury duty. You know, oh. so there's like 400 people, like in L.A., our jury duty pools are yeah. so huge, so big, 400, 500 people in jury duty, and then they get comics to come in and entertain them. Yeah, I haven't heard of that, although I did. That was years ago. It was, was years it? ago. Now they don't need to, because everybody has the, brings their laptop. Yeah. Everybody's working on their phone or whatever, so people don't have to be as distracted. Right. But back then, you know, they were trying to, you know, yeah. give people some reprieve from the dullness of sitting in an auditorium or whatever, right. you know, a big room. I, two years ago, I did jury duty with Kevin Hart. How funny is Sitting that? Sitting next to me. That is too much. In the courtroom. And, um, too yeah, much. I'll never forget, like, I, I, I couldn't stay because I had court-ordered oh. child visitation the next week in Cleveland that I had fought for for years. Wow. And um, I also had shows. And um, I asked twice if I could get out of it. They wouldn't let me. And then the, um, Kevin went and talked to the judge and... They let him out just like that because he had shows. <laughs> so when they, when they asked me, they said, you know, um, could you, the judge said, can you trust any court appointed officer? And I said, I spent 13 years in domestic court. No, absolutely not. Yeah. And um, they still kept me. And I was wow. literally, I was the last group to go to the jury box. And I'm going, I'm freaking out. I got to go see my kids, right? I want to go see. Wow. And I, they call me to the jury box and I, I, I lean back to sit down. My butt is not even in the seat. And the prosecutor turns around and says, I released you. Wow. And I was like, oh. That's good. Yeah, Thank it's you. very hard to get released for jury duty. I remember one time uh, being in the jury pool and different people raising their hands trying to get out. And a lot of them said they were doctors. Yeah. Was, and, the, and the judge wouldn't let any of them go. He's right. like, no. The only person that got re- released was this guy, this Indian guy. And he said, I'm getting married tomorrow night. Oh. And he was getting married like on a Tuesday at yeah. 9 p.m. or whatever. And so the judge released him. I got to use that. Yeah, well, I don't know. That woman well, might believe you. I don't right? know. Hey, listen, thank you so much for coming on today and hanging out and telling me that story. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad they don't have that anymore. Yeah. I, I think it's, yeah, it's really crazy. I, I agree. Anytime, anytime you're trying to make somebody, like I said, you know, do something. That's like trying to do comedy in the DMV. Right. Nobody's here for that. That's an idea. We used to do it. My buddy Jim Coughlin and I did did a comedy. We started a comedy night at Starbucks, uh. but it wasn't a stage. It was just us with a microphone. Right. We did it for like two months on Sunday nights. Yeah. Maybe three months, maybe longer, uh, but it didn't go well yeah. because the sound of the coffee machines, but more than that, again, it wasn't set up for that. Yeah. So people just go to work or do something and then you're in their way. Yeah. We did almost two hours for four people once in Key West. Oh, my God! And I had never done this before. The MC went up and did two minutes. And yeah. then I would do a tag team. I would high-five him. And I would do like four minutes. Then the And I was opening at the time. And then the headliner would come up and do four or five minutes. And then the MC. And we just would rotate. And when the two women got up for the restroom, that was half the audience. So we would just sit there and have a beer with the guys. That's so funny. They'd come back. We went on stage. And it was one of the most... Hilarious. Fun times I've ever had yeah, on stage. Yeah. That's really great. Well, anytime you can be special like that, or you know, you yeah. have uh, you have skin in the game, you know. Yeah, that's fun being part of a group like that and being in a yeah. And once again, completely related to them. Hey, do you like doing the cruise ship thing or? No, I yeah. used to. I just don't care for it. Yeah, how many did you do? Like a lot, like dozens, or? I did like f- I did uh, two weeks on one uh ship and then i did five or six weeks on another what why didn't what didn't you like i didn't like at the time i don't like the fact that you could only use your cell phone once a week yeah. and i wanted to talk to my kids i wanted to talk yeah. to you know sure. people i was with in fact the first week when i got into port i had four more weeks the girl i was dating called me and broke up with me Eesh. and i couldn't call my friends or talk to anybody i was yeah. and then do shows yeah and then they were so restrictive on material i just yeah. i didn't enjoy it i like being very self-expressed on stage yeah. yeah definitely and um it's just 
I just don't like. I like it's the corporate thing. It's the whole yeah. corporate thing. And I've done a lot of those, you know. But there must be some fun cruise ships. There's got to be. There, there probably are, but I'm up to creating some bigger things right now. I think. Yeah, so I'm I know. Not and the thing is, you go that. off on a cruise ship like that, like you're so isolated. Yeah. You know, you get yeah. So you're on stage for a half hour at night, but then the, what about the other twenty three and a half hours? And you're by yourself. Yeah, you're. Stuck. You're not with a band. No. No. You're stuck. You're by yourself. Yeah. Yeah, that's tricky. I'd rather get hit on by Persians. Interesting. I did. What does that mean? Uh, per, 20 Persian swingers six weeks ago at the Ventura Harbor Comedy Club were, uh, after the show in the lounge, were asking me on dates and everything. It was very surreal. <laughs> so I, they were, what were they doing? Having a party oh, a, of some sort? Yeah, a guy walked up to me with his wife and he said, I was wondering if you'd take my wife on this, go to the swingers party as her date on Saturday and do whatever you want. Wow. He Just like that, he said that. And I actually said to him, uh, that's the day I have to get my penicillin prescription refill. <laughs> so that's so odd. What a crazy. Uh, very. I was very odd. Random. Yeah. Hey, listen. Thank you so much for thank coming you. on the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. You guys head over and tweet Pete on Twitter at Pete George TV, and then of course follow me over there as well at Storyworthy. Thank you. Oh, and at Screw Stories. That's the other show. Yes. Will you? Yes. Thank you. And I want to thank all the sponsors on the show today. Really, you guys, when you check out my sponsors like FabFitFun, then you are supporting me and my child, and I appreciate it. And on behalf, one more time, of the very talented Pete George. Thank you, friend. Thank you. This is my awesome. name is Christine Blackburn saying, make it a story worthy week. Thanks for joining us on the Story Worthy Podcast. We'll be back next week with all new stories. Subscribe to Story Worthy on iTunes and visit the Story Worthy website at storyworthypodcast.com. <laughs> Cedar Point's Frontier Festival is back and brimming with new flavor. From May 26th through June 19th, this Old West-inspired street fest will fill Cedar Point with live bands, nightly hoedowns, and a hubbub of family activities. Yup, you'll find wheelbarrows packed with sunflowers and characters straight out of the frontier. But you'll also discover 25 cherry-inspired dishes and over 65 cocktails, seltzers, and beers. Get all the fixins plus savings to boot with the Frontier Festival Bundle, which includes admission, parking, and a tasting card. Only at Cedar Point com dad deserves double the thanks this year so this father's day give him the power tool system that has everything for every job the ryobi one plus tool system now on special buy over 260 ryobi tools powered by one interchangeable 18 volt battery and for a limited time when you make a qualifying ryobi purchase you get one select tool or battery free feels like father's day at the home depot how doers get more done Offer valid through July 31st, 2022. Valid at participating stores and online. Limit one per transaction. Safeway has everything you need to get ready for Thanksgiving. This week at Safeway, get Whole Signature Farms Grade A Frozen Turkey, 10 to 15.5 pounds for $8 each or 16.1 to 22 pounds for $10 each. Member price with a minimum $50 purchase. While supplies last, limit one per household. Plus, mix or match select berries like one pound of strawberries or six ounces of blueberries, red raspberries, or blackberries and get them three for $10 member price. Visit Safeway.com or head in store for more deals.